Okay, good morning to all. Uh, the idea of this one uh, session was supposed to be, uh, uh, so like it's titled Red Flags in Plasti. Uh, I think what, what uh, from a little discussion that we had, what came to our mind was to actually pick out on the nuances of clinical examination imaging and that could uh, sometimes uh, uh, make or break or actually define the outcomes. Uh, that was the idea. We'll do this, uh, uh, but from thin audience, we have, uh, I think it's going to be more of discussion, but it's a small group always has an advantage. So we'll go about this uh, with uh, Rashmin Gandhi going with the subtle things in the pupil. Uh, we'll go with him first. Um, so, uh, pupil and oculoplasty are various uh, intersection of uh, different uh, pupillary reactions or the size with the oculoplastic uh, practice. I've picked up uh, two or three cases. This is a 22-year-old female with mild ptosis, complaints of uh, intense headache. And she does remember that uh, she had a fall three days ago, though she didn't really attach too much importance to it. Her visual acuity uh, were both 6, 6 and 6 in both the eyes. Uh, so one thing uh, which I want to emphasize, this is, a, this is how patient looked like, left eye mild ptosis and headache following a, a trauma which she did not really care much about. And what she was found to have not very clear here is a difference in size of the pupil where the left pupil was a little smaller than the right pupil. So when you are fraught with this uh, clinical scenario where there is a difference in the size of the pupil, the next step in clinical practice would be to see what happens to that difference in size with pupil when the room lights are off and on. We might require a, a reference light which is not very bright in our population because the, the, the iris color is, uh, is dark and we can't really see pupil too well if, it, if the room light is completely off. So what happens to the difference in size of the pupil when the room lights are off versus on? And in this patient, if you see carefully, when the room lights were dim, uh, this pupil dilated, well, this pupil did not. When there is a bright light, both pupils constricted, so the anisocorea was worse in a dim light. So in a dim light, when the room lights are off and there is not much of an ambient illumination, pupils are supposed to dilate. And that dilatation is brought about by sympathetic system. So if a sympathetic system on this side is not functioning, is where this pupil will not dilate, right pupil will dilate, making anisocorea worse in a dim light. So what you are dealing with here is a, a problem Horner syndrome because patient also has a mild ptosis. Now why this is important? This is another uh, example of an anisocoria where you can clearly see that the left pupil is much smaller than the right pupil. So Horner syndrome with pain, and there are three different anatomical areas where you can look uh, where patient complain of pain is an absolute medical emergency. And scenario number one can be an acute facial or neck pain. Uh, where patient might be harboring carotid artery dissection and Horner syndrome being one of the features. Why it is important for us to know uh, is one which, and this paper which came out from Atlanta, 50% of the patients who had ICAD, they actually came to us first. And that's the reason why a potentially fatal condition or condition which can produce quite a bit of morbidity, uh, we should not be missing out because they half of them present to us first. Now, why it is important from a medical standpoint, 60% have a permanent neurological damage and 5% mortality. So that's about uh, facial and neck pain. Horner syndrome with shoulder, scapula, arm or hand pain uh, can be a sign of uh, apical lung tumor, pancos tumor. And 20 to 50% of all pancos tumor had Horner syndrome on presentation. So that's the reason why importance of knowing about uh, a shoulder pain. And third is Horner syndrome with unilateral headache, which can be uh, because of trigeminal neuralgia. Generally, this headache would be cyclical, but can be continuous. And this is something which will be dealt with by neurologist. So that's about anisocoria, which was worse in a dim light. Another example of pupil and ptosis is this. So see, patient has a right ptosis. And uh, when you check ocular motility with torchlight, you'll be able to see that the pupil on the affected side is larger than uh, the left side. So 
a process with large pupil on the side of the disease and you'll find here that mild uh, limitation of ocular motility and a significant or a impressive limitation of motility when patient tries to elevate the eye. So a partial third no palsy with involvement of pupil, again a medical emergency. The reason being 10% uh, of these patients who have a third no palsy with pupil involvement can pass away if they have a, a aneurysm or posterior communicating artery. 50% of them die within one month and rest the survivor would have permanent residual neurological deficits. So a third no palsy, a ptosis with larger pupil on the same side, again a medical emergency, and these patients would require uh, angiography apart from CT or MRI scan. Another uh, important point to note in patients with third no palsy, there's a uh, young guy who had a third no palsy, recovered, uh, was never imaged, and came back with uh, this kind of clinical picture. You can see there is a residual ptosis of the left side, and here, when he adducts, you can clearly see there is a there is a widening of palpable fissure. This sign is called inverse Duan syndrome because generally Duan will uh, you will uh, you probably expect uh, a retraction of the globe. Uh, so this is a sign of aberrant regeneration. Again, uh, something which you should not ignore. If patient was never imaged and there was no history of trauma, then these patients also would require angiography because aberrant regeneration of uh, third nerve is al almost always because of compression of third nerve or because of trauma. Uh, I'll end with this case where not strictly uh, oculoplasty, but the patient who can complain of persistent uh, near vision difficulty uh, in somebody who is in presbyopic age group, but uh, a sign to look for would be another anisocoria. And here you can see the left pupil being little larger than the right pupil. And this anisocoria in this patient was worse uh, in a bright room light environment. So this is uh, an example of AD syndrome. And a simple way to take care of it is to uh, instill diluted pilocarpin. You see that the pupil, left pupil, which was larger, has now become normal size. So that's about uh, pupil, uh, larger pupil, smaller pupil, and a third palsy. Now this is another patient with ptosis with a complete uh, limitation of ocular motility, no adduction, abduction, elevation, and uh, depression. And these are the patients where another important pupillary test, that is pupillary reflex, becomes very important. And this is an example of uh, a swinging flashlight test where you make sure that each pupil is illuminated for equal amount of time and at the same angle. And this is a cartoon showing patient having left RAPD. Uh, just a few a few tips is that this it should be done, the swinging flashlight test should be done in dark room, patient fixating at a distant target, uniform focused light source, avoid near reflex and better view of pupil by shining light from side and below. So in nutshell, pupil and octoplasty can have three potential uh, uh, overlap, anisocoria being worse in a dim light, that being Horner syndrome, anisocoria worse in a bright light with ptosis, third no palsy, and uh, RAPD. I thank you once again. Thanks, Rashmin. Uh, we'll have uh, Akshay next, uh, who's going to talk about uh, eyelid. Thank you, uh, Dr. Surya, for inviting us to be a part of this. So I'm going to be a little more specific uh, uh, with regards to eyelid because I think eyelid tumors are already being considered uh, separately. So this is more about red flags in ptosis. Uh, okay. So. Uh, so more of uh, how. These the red flags are things that I picked up, which are either either my mistakes or mistakes of others, or when we've tried new things. Uh, so I think as you keep doing and uh, uh, operating ptosis and seeing ptosis, the more you realize which ones are best left alone, and so you're able to identify the red flags more. I think the the most important rule, rather than a red flag, is to document every patient at every visit. 
uh, uh, you know, when you document, you are able to have proof of what you've spoken to the patient about. It also is a good idea to document and measure. Check on the day of the surgery as well. And, uh, you know, you always, because you've taken photographs, a patient's history may be a little inaccurate, but photos will never lie. So uh, what do I do? I do on the pre-op, at least one visit pre-op, first day post-op, one week post-op at suture removal and three weeks and at every subsequent visit. If you have this, this also is, is such a kind of an insurance blanket against any, uh, you know, patient related uh, dramas that may pop up later. Uh, this is, is like an index case, a patient with right congenital ptosis and, you know, you'd be tempted to do, uh, he's 618 in the right and the totic eye, amblyopic. So, you know, one would be tempted to do a, a tarsofrontalis sing, but if you see it's an amblyopic eye, he's even at, at, at rest, he's not, you know, trying to elevate his frontalis. So you'd almost be cursed with an undercorrected tarsofrontalis sling if you do that, because uh, it, it doesn't work. So he, the, the next, again, rule rather than a red flag is, in ptosis, uh, you know, you don't always need to do what the book says. If it's poor, to severe ptosis with poor levator function, uh, you almost always have to do a sling. Uh, you can be selective of the cases and figure out which patients are going to improve, especially in unilateral sling. And with a supramaximal levator resection available, you should, you know, uh, uh, harness the option of that to get better results for the patients. So, so the third rule, uh, red flag or, uh, again, is Marcus gun jaw winking phenomenon. Now you can see that in, in the patient on the left, the Marcus gun is correcting itself to the height of the ptosis, uh, height of the contralateral normal eyelid, as opposed to something that is going higher up in the kid. So uh, the, if you have a one-stop solution for all Marcus gun jaw winking phenomenon, you're likely going to have every alternate patient who's going to be unhappy. Because with a hammer in your hand, everything that you see is going to look like a nail. So I always ask the patients, is it the drooping that bothers you or the eyelid movements? And even if the Marcus gun jaw winking may be severe, but patient is not bothered about it and they want only the ptosis to be addressed, do that because ptosis is so much of a cosmetic surgery that uh, uh, giving the patient what they want is the best outcome that you can have. Again, for, so case four, uh, this is a two-year-old girl accompanied by the father and father says that left eye is the smaller, is been small since childhood. And uh, then the mother joined in and said, nonsense, this, the left eye is just today, but usually it's the right eye and father and mother were having a fight. Anyway, I saw it looked like a, you know, congenital left uh, uh, ptosis. So we planned a left levator resection. And on the day of the surgery, that's how the child came. So it's a three-year-old child and you're wondering what was her. Then you could realize why the parents were confused. It turned out to be because of our documentation rule, you could compare. And the child turned out to have a thymoma and was anti-acetylcholine receptor antibodies positive. 10% uh, of all patients who present with ocular myasthenia have a thymoma at presentation under the age of 40. So there's, there's a 1 in 10 chance that in a young myasthenic, you may actually pick up a thymoma. So a CT chest, either you can request it or get it done by a neurologist, is important, especially in uh, myasthenia who are diagnosed under the age of 40. So a uh, red flag for the next one is this 73-year-old male with a recent history of trauma, diplopia. Uh, the ocular motility is restricted in all gazes. There is ptosis and restriction in most gazes. An MRI brain was done and, uh, you know, our, my new squint colleague said this is a partial third nerve palsy and we let it be. Uh, but there was something unusual about it. So all we did was an ice test for five minutes and you could see his motility had completely improved and come back to normal. So ice is nice, myasthenia is not. So a well done ice test uh, is, is always a good thing. Few pearls on, uh, you know, how not to go wrong with an ice test is to keep it for a minimum of two minutes. And do not keep it longer than two minutes because you may then get a false negative. Too cold of a temperature on the eyelids inhibits the, no, uh, the inherent contractility. So in a patient whom you would normally get an ice test positive, because of you now having kept for ice too long, the muscle is not able to contact and you get a false negative. So uh, no more than two minutes if you are assessing ptosis. 
However, if you're assessing ocular motility, you need the, the, the low temperature to spread around. So, 5 minutes is the recommended time for assessing uh, the eyes test outcome in ocular motility. So, uh, there again, you know, document before and after and a 2 millimeter improvement in uh, the eyelid height is considered to be a positive eyes test. So, this is uh, uh, the next red flag, a 43 year old female, history, a female with a history of a, a slap, domestic violence, blurred vision and ptosis and MRI and MRA was done elsewhere and was diagnosed as a third nerve palsy and was put on oral steroids. Uh, this was when we saw her. Now, having imaging done with an MRA also done clears you of, you know, what Dr. Rashmin presented uh, and told us what you should not miss. So, now it was isolated to be an eyelid issue. We did nothing and just waited. In three months' time, it was almost up and in six months' time, she was near normal. So, in traumatic ptosis, don't jump the gun. Time is your friend. If there's trauma, wait for at least six months. Uh, even a cataract surgery or a VR surgery or any procedure where the speculum has been placed to stretch the levator, wait for at least six months for some kind of spontaneous recovery before going in and operating again. Uh, uh, there are videos with this, but I won't go too much into this. Uh, you know, going back to being flexible and not always sticking to one form of uh, uh, one approach of ptosis. If with careful selection based on your phenylephrine test, good cases of mild or moderate, even congenital cases can be uh, operated well with a posterior approach. Uh, I have personal reservations against Fasanella Savat, but I think the Conj MMCR is, is a very good option. So don't be afraid of the posterior approach and with good selection, you may actually get good results, but master the anterior approach because whether it's a primary ptosis surgery and even if your posterior approach has failed, your anterior approach is your fallback uh, option because you've, you, you're so familiar with the anatomy. Uh, so, a lot of people, you know, advise if even if you've done your anterior ptosis, that with a slight undercorrection or overcorrection, at one week on the paracaine drops or topical anesthesia, you can revise. I strongly object because it's not a comfortable uh, feeling for the patient. And if you're going to revise, you might as well do it at least after a week and do it under local anesthesia, even if you want to do it earlier and if you've you, you know, had good results. A little bit of local anesthesia is always better. I think uh, revision under topical anesthesia is almost as bad as probing in office. Uh, the next red flag I'm going to talk about is paying attention to contour. No ptosis, no two ptosis patients are alike in height, in contour, in canthal position and laxity. So therefore, you, you can't do a single technique of placing your sutures, etc. So if you see this patient's contour, there's a clearly pronounced medial droop as opposed to a generalized, you know, almond shaped droop that you would expect. So in the case of you want to make sure that your medial bite is deep, is strong and is actually having an effect on the contour and not just the height. So a, a good way to do this is when the patient is primary position sitting up preoperatively, mark the point on the eyelid where, which coincides with the pupil and that way you will be able to pre-place your, uh, it will be a pre-placed guide as to where to place your contour sutures on medial and uh, lateral sides. The next red flag is about this 40 year old, 44 year old diabetic who had ptosis since four years. She was investigated for myasthenia and thyroid and everything looked okay. So we did an anterior approach, a levator resection in the left eye. And uh, after the surgery, now obviously the right eye, uh, the, in the right eye and the left eye, the herrings had unmasked the ptosis there. And again, the, the, the beauty of having documented, you can see that the brow position in the pre-op photo is also asymmetrical, giving you a, a, an indication that, uh, you know, there was asymmetrical, asymmetrical ptosis that should have been checked and, you know, un herrings should have been unmasked. Herring phenomenon is real and you have to counsel the patient and check for the eyebrow position and gently negate frontalis. And you would, again, patients may say that, you know, I don't have ptosis in both eyes, it's only one eye. But if you've got photos to show that, it helps. So this is another patient with ptosis in the left eye and uh, like Dr. Rashmin had mentioned, retraction on down gaze. And this is again a case of, re -aberrant, of aberrant re uh, This is one of those cases where you do not want to go in and operate and try to check what you, know, what you can improve on. So not all cases of ptosis must be operated upon, operated upon. Just wait, watch and decide what you want to be able to give. 
Red flag patients are, you know, other red flags in, in, in your ptosis clinic are patients who complain, whose main complaint is the previous surgeons who she's visited or patients who had multiple procedures are unsatisfied and, you know, an obsessive approach with a mirror in their hand. They'll point out to possibly un, invisible problems that you cannot appreciate with unre unrealistic expectations. And uh, once the surgery is decided, uh, that too, you know, uh, flags like uh, over familiarity and unnecessary praising, those are the kinds you want to avoid. And repeated cancellation of a surgical date over time also, I've realized, is a red flag. The patient is unsure and is probably going to be unconvinced of the outcome also. And, uh, you know, wanting a picture of looking like, wanting to look like someone is, is a very common kind of uh, request by the patients, which again is a red flag. So just a recap of uh, points to keep in mind uh, and uh, like I said, not completely red flags, but also some uh, pearls from mistakes. Uh, so that I'll end my presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Akshay. Uh, great points. Uh, just a couple of things. I think we are okay with time. Yeah. So we, uh, is Rashmin there? Then I thought that he wanted to leave for the next one. So if there are questions for Akshay, we would be very happy to take them now because I wanted to ask on the ice test though. Yeah. That's, so the question I had is, uh, it, it's great to rule it in. Uh, yeah, but I, it's also a little bit of a, I think because it, a negative one really can't do much. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was a little, uh, this thing about this two minutes and five minutes is something which is a revelation for me, I would say. But otherwise, does how does it actually work out? Ice test generally. Uh, uh, so like, the sensitivity or, you know, the positive predictive value of an ice test is extremely high. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've actually done the study uh, which we published about uh, all patients with myasthenia who present as unilateral ptosis mm. were investigated on the on ice test, anti-acetylcholine antibodies, and uh, neostigmine test. So, uh, and of course, we presented an algorithm of what if it's a patient below 40, above 40, uh, with a prior history of ocular motility disturbance or uh, the first complaint. So, if the ice test is negative, the next best thing to do is to do an anti-acetylcholine receptor antibodies. And the combined specificity of both is close to 95%. So if both are negative, then you virtually ruled out myasthenia. Uh, any other questions? Ganga, any points? Please. Until you have a clinical suspicion of uh, myasthenia, you go for repeated nerve stimulation test or you go for antibody? I go for antibodies and even then if I have a strong suspicion, I actually give a therapeutic trial, uh, which is starting with pyr pyridostigmine, distinon, uh, gravitor, 60 milligram in an adult thrice a day and an elevated step ladder of uh, oral steroids opposed to you what we traditionally do of a tapering. Here it goes in a step ladder increase and then call them back at say six weeks which by then is a good idea to understand. And if a therapeutic trial has still failed, then you know it's probably not going to be my thing. Uh, so uh, we, good morning. Uh, you have such experienced faculty. So I just like to know that, uh, do you have any experience with CPO, with super ended senile doses? Yes, ma'am. CPO also we, we, we published, we presented last year of so aim in cpo because of poor bells is just to under correct and we traditionally go in and do a little bit of uh, a sling usually but you know a sling having to lift a floppy loose thinned out uh, sling may in with coexisting senile uh, ptosis can be difficult so a few patients when we actually went because they also had severe dermatocalysis we had to correct like a mini bleph for functional purposes and that's when we actually saw the thinned out levator so I do you do it in one go or you go stepwise and because I had a patient and you know the whole family of CPO, I operated on the mother then the son and the mother of course was 80 plus and she really was uh, disabled because of her droop. So I had to, I did it stepwise, you know, I undercorrected and then she wanted some more then I did some more and uh, I didn't do much. I didn't do sling for the mother, but for the younger son, uh, he was, uh, he used to stay in the hills. So he said whenever he would drive up, no, he had a lot of difficulty in 
seeing you know so, and he was a very active uh, businessman so i had to do sling so that also i under corrected so this is one very challenging uh, situation yeah cpo uh, uh, the main issue in cpo is that uh, elevation is also problem closure is also a problem so there is a te technique described where we do a tarsal transfer from the upper lid to the lower lid in that way we shift the palpebral aperture superiorly so what we need is a functional uh, vision which is uh, absent in uh, cpo so uh, what that does is uh, we uh, shift the tarsus from the tarsal conjunctival graft from the graft from the upper lid to the lower lid and uh, that actually shifts uh, uh, the palpebral aperture and they have very functional vision for central vision is good and uh, aesthetically of course because it's a shortened tarsus uh, aesthetically it's not that great but uh, functionally the patients are very happy so i've had a i've done about uh, uh, 8 to 10 cases so they're all uh, doing well sometimes we have to revise on it because sometimes uh, it doesn't scar as well we want it to scar we want the upper lid to scar so it doesn't scar as well so we may have to go in again to just uh, do a small another uh, uh, excision and then again closure but usually most of them uh, settle down well uh it shifts up but it shifts up just in this thing so uh, usually the patients adapt because they are very happy with the central vision patient adapt and they uh, uh, they adapt their uh, the treating distance and everything to uh, bend their head and they are they are happy with it so they're more happy without the because their central vision everything their all their daily activities can be done the the facial nerve weakness in myasthenia and in cpo is more important i i had a patient with facial nerve weakness i did a sling but then i had to loosen it that was the only case that i had to loosen the sling by cutting the sleeve off but the lid is remaining in the upper position but still uh, because i think facial nerve weakness is one we uh, even when we examine we should look into myasthenia and cpo right. more than bells and sharma right uh, the cpo discussion is good actually uh, i wanted to ask is it uh, uh, because uh, essentially like uh, you know you basically have to clear the visual axis so between uh, Uh, let's say a tarsal frontal sling with a silicon which i guess would give you a little bit of a reversibility uh, because there is a significant risk of exposure versus a levator surgery or let's say a tarsal transfer from upper to lower are there any uh, preferences of people in the crowd or i think i I'm, i have been loyal to a silicon sling MED and there what we found is that uh, levator gives you a little bit of under correction frontalis gives you a better height but the height of frontalis is not sustained so eventually in follow up your frontalis will end up at the same level where your levator is the amount of lag of thalamus that we got in patients where we addressed the levator was lesser than the frontalis so eventually whatever surgery you do you're going to end up at the same level the most important part though was that in patients who had levator resection the result was very very long lasting frontalis required multiple revisions over a follow up period and we only included patients that had a very long follow up period i think soon we'll have frontalis flap also in the game now yeah more and this was so i think the key thing could be also particularly in cpo could be the uh, how good is the orbicularis function right that could be a deciding point Oh uh, thanks Akshay thanks a lot uh we'll take uh, Tarjini next uh, who's going to talk about infections and uh, red flags related to infections Good morning everyone so while I wait for the slides to go up um thank you very much uh, surya for having me here i think this course has uh, been going on for very many years and uh, we've had a lot of speakers who've been uh, imparting with great pearls of knowledge in various aspects of neuro ophthalmology and oculoplastics 
and I'm also very excited that the chair of the course, the chief instructor, told me that I have loads of time, which you're never told. So uh, I'm going to talk to you about red flags in uh, cellulitis, and uh, the objectives are my of my presentation are to actually take you through, you know, certain aspects of bacterial, fungal, the differentiating features between the two from what I have learned, and then when, how, and what do you do in cases where you can't figure head or tail of what is happening. So let's go through certain aspects of bacterial cellulitis first. So you can see an image of typical cellulitis here. You're seeing all the rubor, pallor, dolor, all of that. And you're seeing uh, imaging which shows you abscesses probably. So there's no second thought of this, right? Looks very much like cellulitis. In certain situations, you see an image like this, where you're thrown off as to what this exactly looks like. And these are the atypical cellulitis pictures where a lot of things come handy, such as microbiology, imaging, histopathology. This actually was a hydatid cyst patient. So what I have learned over the past few years is that children typically tend to have a single organism, bacterial cellulitis, aerobic largely, Strep used to be the most common, but now staff is taking over. Versus adults, as they grow up, you tend to get more polymicrobial. Therefore, your antibiotics have to be targeted. You tend to see more anaerobic organisms. And vision loss in orbital cellulitis is real. About 11% of patients do have vision loss in the pure bacterial version of orbital cellulitis. So I'm just going to run you through a series of cases that I have encountered in my practice. And this, again, is a very typical cellulitis. But what you should be able to pick up from the picture is this localization here. And this being a child, it has to start with your history where you ask the parents, did the child have a watery eye since birth? Because this is a CNLDO which is producing orbital cellulitis in a child. So it's not true that you always need to have an immunocompromised patient for them to develop orbital cellulitis. This is a child who's perfectly immunocompetent, but has thrown up a cellulitis from congenital nasolacrimal duct obstruction. All these abscesses had to be drained, and the child eventually did well. Again, very typical cellulitis here, nothing atypical about this, but just one pearl. When you're imaging and you see this in the setting of cellulitis, it is a gas-producing organism. So the imaging is shouting out at you, as to what antibiotic therapy you should be starting for this patient. Quite often, I have fellows come up to me saying there's a foreign body there, and that is what is producing cellulitis. But this is not foreign body. This is gas-producing organism, which has led to cellulitis. So uh, certain atypical cases that I've had uh, the opportunity to treat. Now, you see this gentleman who's come to you with just a two-day history of very severe pain and this kind of a presentation. And what you see over here on the imaging, you're obviously imaging because it's an orbital disease. You are seeing the guitarpic sign or the tenting of the globe, which all of us saw so much in muca times. Absolutely clear sinuses, hardly any sinusitis over there. And you're thinking, is this bacterial? Is this fungal? What is going on? So in this kind of a situation, I would not hesitate in going and getting some sample from the areas that look most infected for us, it was the lacrimal sac region over here. And we got the microbiology workup. We treated him. And lo and behold, you see that he actually has a lacrimal sac uh, infection, a mucosal residual at the end of it. So this was just acute dacryocystitis, so florid in presentation that it actually went in and produced tenting of the eyeball, which means the patient developed a compartment syndrome, which is not something you see very, very commonly in bacterial cellulitis. The one part here that helped us was on micro, we ruled out a fungal infection. And therefore, we bombarded this patient with steroids. And he had a complete recovery in his vision. He presented to us with counting fingers vision because of the tenting. But over the follow-up period, uh, antibiotics, 48 hours, steroids, he came back to 2020 at the end of the treatment. So that's something that helps you. Always, wherever you can use microbiology and histopathology, you should go ahead and do it. And this is him after the DCR. Now, this was intriguing. This was a suspected bacterial uh, cellulitis. The patient was diabetic. We treated him with antibiotics, but this is what we saw at the end of treatment. 
So we followed the same protocol, antibiotics, 48 hours, steroids. And this is him after about 10 days. And we couldn't figure out why the chemosis wasn't disappearing. So we repeated imaging. And what do you see over here? Well, not foreign body. So you see that he has SOV. But what in the SOV? It is dilated, but there's a thrombus sitting in the SOV. This is a post-contrast scan. Right? You see the blood vessels highlighting here. But within the SOV, there is thrombosis. And this is what we were taught in school days, the classic Furkov triad, where you have stasis leading to thrombosis, infection leading to thrombosis. This patient had to be put on aspirin for the thrombosis to resolve. So this was an SOV thrombosis that occurred as a result of orbital cellulitis. And following treatment with is, uh, aspirin as well as long-term steroids, you can see that the inflammation in the orbit has completely resolved. And this is his uh, image. This is the SOV after uh, the treatment period where you can see that the thrombus has now completely resolved. So on the same lines, again, thinking orbital cellulitis, right? Clinical picture very much like orbital cellulitis. And the fellows were very, very, uh, you know, uh, hesitant about starting um, IV treatment. And I asked them, why is it? And they said, we can palpate something there. There's something wrong here. And we did an imaging, and this is what we saw on the imaging. So what are you thinking? Sinoorbital could still be fungal, right? Could still be cellulitis. But whenever you see this kind of a picture, it's always important to get a histopathology and microbiology like we discussed. This patient had a CA maxilla. So even though he presented with signs which look exactly like orbital cellulitis, it was a mass, and this is him after chemotherapy. Partial resolution, he's awaiting further surgery for complete treatment of the CA maxilla. Now, one more similar looking patient, just that there's no inflammation, but it's sinoorbital. So what are we thinking? Probably mass, probably fungal. That's what we were thinking. We know that biopsy helps. We went in and biopsied, and this only turned out to be E. coli. Micro grew only E. coli. There was no mass. There was just suppuration on histopathology. This lady had an endogenous E. coli infection from a long-term UTI that she had. Even though the eye was completely quiet and it actually looked like a mass, but it was an infection. And she's had only 10 days of augmentin. And that's how she looks at the end of treatment with aug augmentin. So what I'm trying to say is things can be very, very confusing when you're looking at orbital cellulitis. But it would be nice to go that extra step and to get tissue for histopathology as well as for microbiology smears and cultures and then get your diagnosis. One such another case, to me this was out and out a mass lesion. I was thinking on lines of malignancy. You see these areas over here everywhere that I have highlighted. But I couldn't figure out why the eye looked like this, why the eye was inflamed. There was panophthalmitis inside on the B scans. There were vitreous echoes everywhere. So I couldn't really figure out what it was. Again, resorting to biopsy. This is the imaging, by the way. So you see florid involvement all around. It's preceptal, it's orbital. And look at the bone. The bone there has this eaten appearance. This was actinomycosis. And you see the sunburst appearance of the, these bacilli on histopathology. So we had to stain the histopathology slides and show it to the microbiologist to tell us what exactly this is. And that's the kind of intervention you may need in cases that turn out to be confusing. We eventually lo lost that patient. So for the bacterial spectrum, we know that you have an acute onset in bacterial cellulitis. You have general symptoms, fever, malaise, all of that. You have uh, your CBC to rely on. You have a red sign, red eye, signs of infection. And you can largely localize it to the sinuses. And Augmentin works wonders. You always give a follow-up of steroids after 48 hours. Microbiology usually helps you in 45% of the cases. But I showed you that there are certain other things that you need to pay attention to, especially NLDOs congenital or acquired SOV thrombosis that might occur in the setting of cellulitis. And sometimes you may have infection with anaerobes where you should suspect an endogenous cause. And you may need to add up with um, uh, antibiotics with, uh, which are specifically targeted to anaerobes such as the carbapenems. Now briefly talking about the fungal spectrum. So two organisms that largely are there in our kitty, mucorails and aspergillus. We saw a lot of muca during the COVID time, but aspergillus is just as common. 
mucorrhals more in diabetics and aspergillus more in HIV patients or other causes of immunodeficiencies. And we all know the typical spectrum with which fungal disease presents. We know that there's also bone involvement, bone destruction, and it's largely cyanohorbital. And again, histopath and micro comes to rescue. So this is one such gentleman mucomycosis. Look at the subtle restriction of abduction in the right eye. So he was post COVID and this is a scan which is shouting out loud that it is mucomycosis, sinuses are debrided, you don't see any turbinates there. He's already had that and the orbit is involved. And in a matter of a day, he went on from that subtle uh, restriction of abduction to total uh, ophthalmoplegia over here. This is what fungus can do. It can be a quiet eye but shows very quick progression and sinuses are usually haze, uh, hazy. We did not exenterate him. We removed just the necrotic areas in the MRI and this is his follow-up. He regained from counting fingers back to 2020, not exenterated, living today, following up for over two and a half years. So that's the kind of targeted treatment that sometimes you need for muca. Now this one picture, Akshay can uh, kind of relate to this, is again muca, but look at the sinuses. So it doesn't mean that muca has to enter the eye only through the sinuses. There are several other routes via which it can enter, largely the pterygopalatine fossas that you should be looking for on imaging. Now, a few atypical cases that I've had the fortune, if I may say, to see uh, or examine or treat. This is a lady who came with this kind of nodule. I couldn't figure out what is going. Imaging showed this sclerosis of bone. Not much destruction, but thickening. And I've come to learn over time that this is what happens in a lot of fungal diseases. This turned out to be aspergillosis. We biopsied not only the nodule, but also the bone, both of which showed aspergillosis. We treated her with long-term um, antifungals. Her clinical situation does, did not change much, but she has been uh, kind of in clinical remission. Now, if we had an oncology session just before this, you see the scan, what do you think? Lacrimal gland and something at the apex. This is shouting out adenoid cystic carcinoma, right? Perineural spread. But if you look closely, this is what has happened to the bone. The bone is destructed over here. So again, biopsied, turned out to be fungus, but there was already a telltale sign. You see this kind of a fistula, you should be thinking it's a fungal disease. So this again turned out to be a fungal infection and has been on treatment. This is his post-treatment scan where you can see some resolution in the lacrimal gland as well as the apical portion of uh, the lesion. And typically in fungal diseases, radiologically you can say resolving when you start seeing new bone formation like this. So the destructed margins of the bone tend to get better over a period of time. This was thoroughly confusing for me, single muscle enlargement. Um, everything under the roof was on my differential diagnosis. Initially thought it's just myositis, let's treat with steroids. But something just put me off and I said, okay, wait, let's biopsy coarse edges somewhere on the muscle and turned out to be fungal disease. And we had to treat her with aspergillosis. One more lady, my fellows were shouting thyroid eye disease over here, retraction and all of that. I said, no, wait, something just looks off. Biopsy turned out to be fungal. But before biopsying, did a CT scan. And what did the CT scan show? Destruction in the bone over here and a lesion which is actually sinoorbital. So don't get, uh, you know, misguided by certain scan pictures. And she's been on antifungals and that's how she's resolved. Just the last case, everything that looks cellulitis is not always cellulitis. This to me looked very much like cellulitis. This is a HIV positive patient. But on biopsy, turned out to be a high grade lymphoma. Uh, we eventually lost this patient. She had multiple metastases all over. This is her after the biopsy. And about a month into the treatment, uh, we lost the patient. So to summarize, fungal infections can masquerade as anything under the roof. Typically, you would see it in an immunocompromised patient. It has a subacute presentation. Ophthalmoplegias are very common. If you see cutaneous fistulas, bone destruction, or hyperostosis of the bone, still suspect fungal micro and path really comes in handy in these situations. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tarjini. Questions, comments? OK, uh, that was a lovely presentation, Tarjini. So this is Thanks. an open question both to you and to the audience. I anecdotally know of two patients from other people where the patient underwent drainage of an abscess, which was fairly superficial, preceptal eyelid, 
and one lacrimal abscess. So these are obviously patients who have not been prognosticated for loss of vision and so on. The next day, the patient is no peer. OK, has anybody else come across this? So I would presume this has to be a toxin because there was no spread of the infection deep into the orbit. Has anybody else come across such a situation? And if so, what could have been done about it? So one case I can remember is about a muker that I treated in the COVID season where only one eye looked involved and it was extensive involvement and a plan was made to exenterate that eye. That eye was exenterated and next day the patient was no PL in the other eye. And that was not a surgical complication. There was no ophthalmic artery tone or embolism or something like that. It's just that we missed subtle mucor on the other side and that became perineural on the other side and we lost no, vision. The, these were both staff, mm. staph aureus. Even, even I had a similar case, aged lady, uh, not a known diabetic or hypertensive, clear cut orbital collection. I generally do aspiration with uh, 18 gauge rather than actually draining because it works well. Uh, and she actually improved because on table proptosis was less. So she became better, but she lost her vision, not like exactly no PL, but it became like significantly low. And uh, yeah, eventually she recovered from the infection, but she lost her vision and the uh, abscess was nowhere near the optic nerve uh, so that like while aspirating or compression or something but I have seen one patient yes I don't know if it's the sudden decompression while you aspirate so, that could have an so effect superficial yeah so, may, maybe an embolus possible just tough luck maybe Compliments to the speakers and spectrum of cases. I think uh, just as how intravitreal in infections are now being considered for almost immediate or early post antibiotic steroids, inflammation has a significant role in the pathogenesis of orbital disorders and vascular infiltrative disorders. So any form of manipulation is drainage, aspiration, whatever it is, or the natural history alone of the disease is enough to actually predispose towards those kind of optic neuritis related visual loss rather than a vascular visual loss. So to be kept in mind. Uh, the question I had for you, Tarjani and all of Indian experts is that COVID really brought out the worst of poor health of our South Asian patients and also contamination, God knows whatever it is. Question for you is all the fungal cases that you've seen, how many of them had received steroids by a general practitioner, a primary ophthalmologist, in some form or the other, which has been causing the festering of the fungal infection for you to manage radically. Thank you. A lot of patients of mucomycosis that I saw in my practice had received steroids, a lot of patients, systemic steroids, largely because these were uh, post-COVID and that was considered as a mainstay of treatment for COVID in our part of the world, um, remdesivir shortage or whatever you might say. So uh, yes, a lot of them had received fungal. But I want to talk about the opposite spectrum if there's two minutes. So there, there are a couple of cases of fungal granulomas, right? No COVID, nothing. Just pure, simple fungal granulomas that you tend to see, which tend to remain indolent. And like you spoke about uh, steroids and endophthalmitis, do you feel there is a role of a tiny depot of injection of steroid even in those kind of fungal cases? Because they just stay there. They don't disappear either clinically or on radiologically. You do serum markers, you do galacto manin assays, they are in the normal range, which tells you that systemically the fungus is not really florid. So do you inject a depot of steroid there? Well, refractory ones, but to me, non-steroidals are the usual part of treatment of any infection, curbing the early stage of inflammation. After about 24, 48 hours, when the smoldering inflammation, to me, I have a low threshold for steroids. Usually you have to get it cleared by the ID guys and usually they're ambivalent. Never agree. Absolutely. Uh, the reason I brought this up concept of steroids is because in the 1950s and 60s, there was a spate of fungal corneal infections around the world. And people are wondering what happened in the 1950s and 60s. Just in the 40s and 50s, topical steroids was in the market. Right. So the use of steroids by unsupervised agents or whatever it is, is what I think is causing a lot of these fungal infections. I thought I should bring that to everybody's attention. 
thank you so much uh one uh, that case about uh, actinomycetes so uh, how the, did the pathologist suspect uh, actinomycetes or? nobody suspected when the sample went they said there's this one collection of bacteria here we don't know what it is obviously the pathologists are not as great as the microbiologists so then and we work as a team mm -hmm. so we had the microbiologists stain the pathology slides and then tell us what do you think this looks like to you and they were like oh this is the sunburst appearance you see in actinomycosis and they see a lot of it from canaliculitis to, to choose the stain you would have to choose a uh, so that's the micro stain. invading no, their turf which i don't how, want how the thought process to actually think about actinomycosis. because they did see the bacilli right you're able to see the bacilli on your hne and based on that they said definitely infection what we don't know but yeah the, the, there's a difficulty in the culture right. but was it nocardia or was it what, what did they it was not nocardia it was actinomyces because that uh, ct scan coronal that you showed Bold and uh, we'd seen it uh, some time ago and that was that was typical it was that and then when we looked at the literature we found that that kind of a moth eating appearance is supposed to be very specific and i think the difference between whether it is actinomyces or nocardia is whether because nocardia tend to be uh, more deeper in the orbit so and then you might have small micro abscesses which come on the skin and they come in crops and go away mm. but they a lot of uh, bone changes that tends to always make you feel that this is a malignancy or something yeah. great any other questions uh, and so i think the last speaker for the day akshay are you sorry Yeah. So the last speaker for the day is Dr. Suryasnath Rath from uh, LV Prasad uh, Bhuvaneshwar. Over to you, Surya. Thanks. so good morning to you all uh, uh i have uh, a small selection of cases uh, uh this the first is this gentleman who came from uh, bengal uh had a history of comorbidities but had this progressive lesion uh since 2017 and uh, uh <laughs> we we get quite a few of them and then i tend to say that they sort of incubated for a while and then they come but uh the on the examination the things that were interesting were that you had this lesion which was uh you know uh most of the medial canthus a third of the upper eyelid uh there was a significant fixity to the skin uh so you were looking at an orbital involvement uh so that's what uh, the examination findings and had those typical rolled out edges so it was all written out this was a basal cell uh the key thing was uh, the location was such and we all sort of thumb rule the medial ones are more uh, destructive and can uh, be worse in prognosis so uh, the thing i think uh, we were pretty clear was that this is definitely orbital invasion there's no way we are probably looking at a destructive surgery uh, like an exentration we asked for an imaging and that's the imaging finding uh, these axial cuts uh, lower down tend to show something that that's the lesion and you see looks like it's also the lacrimal sac area that's involved another cut it tends to show that there seems to be not only the lacrimal sac but looks like even the nld that seems to be dilated compared to the other side so we've got something where you have an involvement which is extending right up to the nld now going back to the lesion of obviously it was uh, the suspicion was very much there but the imaging was very very helpful that it was not only an exentration but you know when you are looking at uh, a lesion like that you have to have a plan because essentially surgical extirpation is what you would like to do now these cuts came out nice and we we actually looked at them this one clearly shows the difference on the right and the left side and uh, 
when you look at a sagittal cut again that's what so how a how much further so the thing about imaging is it tends to tell you that there is something but when you're planning on a surgical how much is the extent is something which is uh it's a little difficult to really make out um we planned for an uh for a confirmation because that there were no reports i mentioned that earlier there were no reports uh, that the patient had and pretty much came out as a basal cell uh, that was confirmed uh the choice was uh, of the surgical plan was to go ahead with uh, an orbital excentration uh the other modalities were very much uh, not something that would be suited to this patient now uh when we planned the surgery uh we marked this out we sent out on the skin for frozen sections we sent them out and they came out negative now this is what in addition so when you actually we went to the nasolacrimal duct now traditionally we are taught you have to you have to go in and actually take it right at the junction of the lacrimal sac to the nld but that's where it's it's difficult to approach but this was clearly an infiltration there so what we did was i've superimposed this uh, skull image and we've actually taken out we deroofed deroofed that section and took out that bone but that could only take us a little further up to show what we had always suspected so the picture that you have on the right actually shows that uh, let me use the cursor so this shows that the lacrimal uh the lacrimal sac and the nld were definitely enlarged thickened and looked infiltrated now how much further i thought about sending another set of frozen sections but this was clearly infiltrated so we had already deroofed part of this bone and what we did is we removed this entire segment of bone we chiseled this out and then we were literally we had taken out all of the nld now the key question was was it only up to the nld or was the nasal mucus also involved i don't know now uh this was to the towards the end of surgery and actually on the on the time i had i, was, I had in mind that whether i can still send another so the bone was obviously sent for uh for fixed section reports because they need to be decaled and all and uh we sent for uh so this is the frozen section which talks about only the skin uh margins that we had sent and they were on negative so essentially we took a part of the nasal mucosa too so i was right into inside the meters and uh, uh later after the surgery i looked up with an endoscope obviously the some mucosa was missing from there but i thought we would be okay let's see the the on an endoscopic examination the mucosa didn't look infiltrated was definitely inflamed but could go anyway so now let's come to the pathology uh this is the uh you know the on the gross specimen uh we had this was the region where the pathologist called us to identify and mark the sections because she wanted that detail so that she could do the uh, uh sections accordingly and we thought that essentially you know all our interest is in the lacrimal sac region so just make sure that we've gotten all the uh, we've gotten we've taken out the whole tumor and if i can know if exactly what's the level of the transection wherever we've cut the nasolacrimal duct is that clear number 2 is there uh, uh if you can actually mark out till what extent was the involvement of the tumor now this section actually uh was uh, from the orbital soft tissues and it actually shows that uh, the most of the orbital soft tissue which was constituting the skeletal muscles and the fatty tissue was infiltrated by the tumor um but the surgical margins were free this section came in which actually showed the angle the iris that was uninvolved by tumor cells but if you looked at the some sections of the eyelid and the cornea there were definitely there was a lot of infiltration as far as the conjunctiva was concerned the palpable conjunctiva the tarsal conjunctiva the fornicular conjunctiva was all involved and that would be expected from what we saw in the clinical picture picture showing the cornea and the sclera both of them have a partial thickness infiltration 
this is the nasolacrimal duct at the transection was free so that was a sigh of relief the nasal mucosa was fortunately free of tumor these are high magnification pictures of the nasal mucosa the bone was also free of any tumor infiltration and the optic nerve this was not where we had seen on the scans the tumor was but this was free and was to be expected this was a one day post op this is a two month post op picture of the patient he did develop actually a small fistula which would probably need uh, an additional intervention but uh, he's okay he's happy and there was a lot of difficulty coming there was a reason why he came after so much time from 2017 uh, but uh, i thought the fact was that while the location of the tumor was a flag was a red flag the key thing was to look out for infiltration and sure enough on a keen observation actually the nld and had it not been uh, anticipated probably the surgical uh, plan could have could not have been delineated that clearly so there was something in the imaging that was very very uh, uh, useful from the management perspective the second case i have is a is a 49 year old female who presented with this lower eyelid mass and this was 4 months and she had an interesting uh, story again she was coming from um, from another uh, state and there was a history of a prior surgery and this had been done about a year ago and uh, she didn't have uh, all she carried was a report not actually the histopath but no slides no uh, uh, nothing else apart from one report which had this mention that this was a poorly differentiated carcinoma versus a malignant melanoma so if you actually look at the picture this was the scar from the previous surgery now it was just a papule it was 8 by 6 mm in size uh there was an adjacent scar there was no ulcer there was nothing else now the report that she carried now obviously no self respecting melanoma would actually be <laughs> you know uh that was been quite a bit of time but the issue was obviously like we all face what do you do do you wait or do you actually go ahead and uh based on uh, logistics uh, the difficulties of coming again again she actually uh, agreed but basically we actually somehow try to convince her that this is a small lesion you want to live with uh, yes no keep coming uh, you know change in that place or whatever or do you want to actually come in and uh, let's probably excise with a little bit of margin and see what exactly is so that's what we planned now that was a uh, uh, you know on the safe side i don't have a picture to show after the excision but definitely needed a flap to cover that but uh, essentially the histopaths came in and it actually showed there were lobular nests and cords of epithelial cells that were there there were nest aggregates and that showed the peripheral palisading that was there now there was uh, there was nuclear pleomorphism and uh, the the peripheral palisading was more focal and this was a little atypical for a basal cell so that's what and usually in a scenario like this the pathologist asks for a immunohistochemistry cytokeratin and this was a uh, positive negative for several hmb 45 s100 adipofilin were all negative they also did a uh, few other uh, ihc markers but essentially based on that they were clear that this is definitely not bcc not basal cell came out to be a trichoblastic carcinoma which was a low grade so well, that's interesting at least from the lesion that i saw and the kind of importance that i gave it on the first examination was quite a revelation because i most likely uh i know that there was a reasonable choice if she would have uh, hesitated i would have probably let it go 
but turned out the trichoblastic carcinoma is actually a, a pretty rare one and in all about 90 odd have been reported in the world and uh, um, quite a few can actually turn up de novo and again local excision is usually the way to go this is almost a year after the surgery was done and uh, uh, the diagnosis that came out was a trichoblastic carcinoma so essentially um, sometimes when a previous surgery has been done and the report mentions and even if clinical examination uh, uh, you know tends to suggest that there's probably nothing much it's a good idea to give credibility to a previous report and still uh, think about uh, confirming that unless the morbidity from the surgery is not too much uh, like i mentioned about 87 percent are de novo and a very few actually have adverse outcomes this is uh, the third case i have and uh, this elderly gentleman <clears throat> reported he was from odisha and he had this draining uh, sinus from there and uh, was about three to four months duration and uh, <clears throat> no other positive history as such which was significant this is the ct scan and actually our records didn't have so this is a scan that is a little low in resolution but it does show is that you have a significant amount of erosion and uh, it's pretty much epicentered in the sphenoid trigone that's good components in the orbital and uh, looking at this lesion there was a think that probably is this malignancy or is this an infection or shorter uh, duration of uh, onset was something which was likely to be but there was something else in our mind which and that's the reason I kept this and on a histopath it actually turned out to be a necrotizing granulomatous inflammation in a country where uh, TB is endemic uh, so and it, quite interestingly uh, that was the lead we got from pathology Montu was really high. The chest X-ray was uh, didn't show anything typical, but the quantiferon TB gold was highly positive. Again, there was a suspicion it could be sarcoid. The serum ACE were mild elevations, but this was ruled out. Based on that, actually, the patient was sent to a TB dot center and uh, started on medications with good improvement. And that's him uh, who came after four months of ATT. That's him. That's all I have for uh, three cases. We could uh, still utilize about 10 minutes uh, before we finish. Akshay has to say something. The mic. Yeah, uh, you know, very interesting cases. One challenge that you know people outside, at least in non-institute settings, have is getting the right advice from the pathologist of what IHC to use and what uh, marker to go by. And uh, also, you know, the harsh reality of economics outside is such that yeah, IHC, uh, you know, sometimes reaches the matches the surgery price itself. So yeah, it's a little tricky sometimes, but uh, and it may help to actually speaking uh, speak to the pathologist to find out what uh, IHC markers will help maximize the uh, you know positive the the, the outcomes of the uh, your IHC markers you know uh, picking the right ones and if need be you know you, you can always reach out to expert ocular on pathologist to guide you that's something we've learned the you know the harsh way in private practice thank you for saying those yeah, I mean, uh, you know, any kind of uh, particularly oncology related or even otherwise, I think uh, a good pathology uh, backup or a service is extremely important. I think all of us would, uh, there's no question about that.
So how often do you see that? And that's something, again, when you work with ophthalmic pathologists, reliable ones from institutions, make sure that they're able to supply the paraffin blocks for subsequent review elsewhere in the country. Uh, do you have the challenge? Uh, we do face that. But I would say, Ganga, that you know, uh, more often than not, actually, we do have uh, patients who've gone elsewhere or uh, particularly for uh, you know treatment at cancer centers. Quite often, this, uh, this comes as a query. And we are more than happy to actually give them the block because it, it actually takes, I mean, there's no point. Otherwise, most likely they're going to undergo another, you know, biopsy and uh, there's so much. So uh, at our institution, we have very much a practice that we very easily allow. There's a disclaimer that pathologists uh, usually ask for because if there is just one block, they would be sharing that. Uh, so they usually ask for the patient to sign on a form. Uh, but that has ap happened after I, I used to face that challenge early on, but I asked them that if the patient really needs it, even if it's a single block, we should. Uh, and I think over time that's happened. So these days we do share it, even if we have just one block uh, with us. Right. So now that you have OPAI, which is a very mature society, and there's an ocular pathology society of India also, something like that, yeah. if I remember right. I think one of the standards you should have for members, especially from institutions to join, be prepared to give these blocks. This, in my opinion, similar to the refractive parameters post-refractive surgery. I think we have an obligation to be able to offer it to the patients, at least on demand, if you don't routinely provide it. It's one thing. The second thing is there are patients who are sometimes referred to us after a funny malignancy like your eyelid lesion. Was, and we went back in when, for repeat surgery, we found no semblance of malignancy at all. And that puts us in a very delicate situation. Was the first report flawed? Did they completely excise it when the margins were actually reported positive? And I've had several situations. I had this one unique individual, young, educated Indian lady who had a chalazine for two to three years, multiple surgeries. Uh, she demanded a biopsy of the third oculoplastic surgeon. Came back as sebaceous gland carcinoma. Referred to me for definitive management, not of the disease alone, but of the patient as well. So went and excised wide excision of the indurated area, no semblance of malignancy. Yeah. Now the patient is challenging the original diagnosis, reviewed the block, sebaceous gland carcinoma, and now insists that is not her tissue. <laughs> she says, I lead a clean, healthy living. And it's almost a point of threatening a lawsuit against the physician. Just to let you know, patients are becoming very sensitive about the pathological reports. And that's where the institutions with which you work is going to be very important. A practical problem I thought I'd share with you. Uh, yeah, you, you know, when, when you share that, I have an experience of my own where actually I got a, a message that the frozen section was positive. I went ahead and uh, did additional resection. And then, uh, and obviously, you know, a much longer reconstruction, whatever else I needed to do. And then the second sections that were said, there's no malignancy there. So, uh, so, you know, but one thing that I learned from there is next time I said, please load it onto the EMR that this is the frozen section report. Because uh, that's, <laughs> yeah, Roshu. Okay, on the same theme, the flip side of the coin. Uh, I do think it behooves all of us to educate our patients. Far too many of our patients are not aware how important the pathology reports are. They, they are handed the report, they lose it. They're handed the slide and block, they lose it. I've seen patients who've been biopsied elsewhere three or four years ago, never bothered to pick up the report. And then I go searching, call up that institute, that do you have that report? Then they pick it up. So whenever, you know, I think it is an obligation on each of us. Whenever we are treating a patient, you drill it into their minds multiple times exactly how important the report is. Report, slide, block, whatever it is. Please hang on to it the rest of your life. Any other questions, uh, comments? Uh, I mean, in general, not just, uh, uh, you know, eyelid, specific eyelid tumors. So over the, I mean, just to, just to get a sense of the audience, uh, for eyelid malignancies, especially sebaceous gland carcinoma, 
uh, do you include PET as a part of your initial assessment or is that uh, based on clinical risk features or size of the tumor? Uh, well, as for me, I would probably not include it as a as a preliminary. Uh, but if uh, I think most of the time, see, uh, for logistic reasons and the difficulty with which uh, usually um, it's to get a PET scan done, I would reserve it to only a very few with the suspicion that there could be something or a possible mates or something is more. But I would uh, like to have comments. In all sebaceous gland carcinoma, I usually do a map biopsy. 19 points, not even 17, 19 points map biopsy. That is mandatory I do for every case. That is number one. And number two, based on the biopsy report, if their map is positive, then I give a pet. I give it to quite good numbers, especially for sebaceous gland. just talking now pet cts nowadays are not as expensive as in the past number one but yes if I, for whatever reason it's really differing uh, because of the cost then routine imaging and the argument again is a ct scan or mri of the chest thorax abdomen pelvis always comes in the issue also arises when you're following up these patients how often and how serially are going to be imaging these patients for systemic metastasis but in a developed setup i think that has become the standard of care and you negotiate with somebody where you can get reasonable costs, uh, how we used to do in the past. But what would be the frequency? The pathology in the map biopsy has got nothing to do with the staging workup. Because you're right, I mean, we go to the T1, T2, T3, T4. Uh, but if you decide to work up systemically, then systemic workup is exactly the same. Yeah. No, but what, what I was asking was, uh, how often do you think in the follow-up? That's the question. In the follow-up... How often would you actually go ahead and do an investigation, at least for a systemic metastasis, once a year or more frequently is in the follow-up? That's And what do you think is followed elsewhere? Uh, I think the oncological principle is very similar to your basal cell carcinoma screening. You're more intense in the first two to three years. It's almost every six months after you've treated the patient for two to three years. After that, it becomes almost nine months to a year. And I have patients five years, 10 years out who are so comfortable, the oncologist, oncologist is so comfortable with them. Routine physical examination and non-invasive, inexpensive examination screening is what they're doing now. That's our practice. Thanks. I think uh, we're almost uh, there and uh, we'll just give a little more time to the next session. Thank you all for attending. Great to have you here. Thank you.